In May 2016, a 40-year-old man with dark, curly hair, olive skin, and an accent was scribbling on a notepad in a crazy script on an airplane as it was taxiing. A quick-thinking passenger, suspecting a potential terrorist, notified the crew, who pulled the plane back to the gate. The man was then taken off the plane and interrogated about his activities. It was quickly determined to be a misunderstanding. The man, Guido Menzio, was an economics professor at UPenn of Italian origin, and his crazy scribbling was his computations that would eventually become a paper entitled The QSS Pricing Rule. This incident would end up being the third article listed on a Google search of his name, but this is not the incident of a man getting interrogated because of his mathematics that I wanted to focus on. No, this story is a legend in applied mathematics, because it really was the math that got him into trouble. But we had to get there first by understanding how he did it. The hero of our story is a man by the name of G.I. Taylor, or Jeffrey Ingram Taylor to those who know him. He was born in 1886 to a family with mathematics in its blood. His grandfather was George Boole, who formulated Boolean logic and algebra, upon which others would build most of information technology, even going as far as getting the Boole variable type named after him to represent true or false statements. Many of Boole's descendants would also become academics. For example, Taylor's aunt introduced the term polytope to describe certain higher dimensional shapes. Needless to say, he was raised in an environment to form great academic skills. As a result, Taylor wound up at Cambridge and joined a very prestigious academic lineage. He studied under J.J. Thompson, whose most famous discovery was that of the electron, and who would win the Nobel Prize for his efforts. Thompson himself had studied under Laura Rayleigh, whose most famous discovery is probably Rayleigh scattering, which explains why the sky is blue, who separately won a Nobel Prize. Rayleigh studied under Lord Kelvin, whose contribution to thermodynamics was so large that Kelvin is now the standard unit of temperature, and under Sir George Stokes, whose name marks the Napier-Stokes equations of fluid mechanics. Taylor started off studying physics, with his first paper studying interference patterns in feeble light, as the title calls it, exposing the photographic plate over the course of three months to see an interference pattern. But after this, he started studying fluid dynamics, which would end up being the work he was most known for. He won several early prizes for his work on turbulence and shock waves, and designed aircraft parts during World War I, learning to fly at the same time. After the war, he turned his attention to oceanography, and studied another famous problem relevant to our story. The taylor cowett flow consists of two concentric cylindrical walls of radii R1 and R2, spinning at angular velocities F1 and F2, with kinematic viscosity mu. Of the two people this flow is named after, Coet did study it first as a means to measure the viscosity of fluids, but Taylor's analysis of the system became a basis for much of the future analysis of hydrodynamic stability. Depending on the combination of parameters, the flow's behavior can range from simple laminar flow to vortex structures to outright turbulence, and we have five parameters to play with. While it is possible to set the radii and angular velocities by building the apparatus and designing the spinners correctly, Controlling kinematic viscosity is a much trickier ask. And besides, even five variables is a lot to account for in an experimental context. So, to reduce the scope of the analysis, we need to learn a new tool, the Buckingham Pi theorem. In any physical problem, we consider physical quantities, such as length, mass, time, temperature, and chard, or powers of these quantities called dimensions. Using our example here, the radii have lengths, the angular velocities have units of 1 over time, and the kinematic viscosity is a length squared over time. The specific units do not matter so long as it measures the right quantity. A kinematic viscosity is valid if it uses meters squared per second or square miles per month. By sheer coincidence, there is about a 1% difference between these two quantities as measured in these units. A famous result about these quantities is the Buckingham Pi theorem which states that if you have n-dimensional parameters and k physical quantities, you can produce n-k non-dimensional parameters, called pi's, which describe the problem. The proof of this boils down to a version of the rank nullity theorem of linear algebra fame. In short, the pi's span a null space whose dimension is measured as n-k. For example, in the taylor cowett flow, we have five dimensional parameters and two physical quantities, time and length. That means we can reduce the problem to three non-dimensional parameters that span this null space. 
Launch lengths of what we could use are mu, the ratio of angular velocity, eta, the ratio of radii, and this final quantity, which matches the viscosity with the inner angular velocity and radius, which would later bear Taylor's name. Note that any basis for this null space would work. For example, Taylor himself did not use this Taylor number, but rather the Taylor number multiplied by a quantity in mu and eta. The power of this is that many different configurations can be easily described. Take eta, for example. If it is close to 1, that means that r1 is only a little smaller than r2, which suggests that the channel is going to be thin relative to the size of the apparatus. Mu, on the other hand, can say how the object is rotating relative to itself. A negative value indicates that the walls are moving in opposite directions, and the magnitude tells us how fast the outer wall spins relative to the first. This tool of non-dimensionalization is one of the key tools in fluid dynamics and physics in general, because it reduces the scope of the problem to a fewer number of parameters. If a certain element of physics can be neglected, it is often expressed as a particular non-dimensional number being prescribed as negligibly small compared to other terms in this problem. Many non-dimensional parameters are used in different disciplines to compare the situations present in the dynamics. At different times in my life, I've come across the Taylor number, the Reynolds number, the Mach number, the Froude number, the Rosby number, the Weisenberg number, the Prandtl number, and the Deborah number, just to name a few. I'm going to pause here if you want to read their basic descriptions. If you have a favorite non-dimensional number, share it in the comments. As cool as the Taylor Couette problem is, this is not the problem that got him in trouble. Over time, he would continue to publish all sorts of work in fluid dynamics, until during World War II, he was brought into the war effort by studying blast waves in air and water explosions. During the war, he also became a fellow of the Royal Society, which is basically a knighthood for scientific contribution. Eventually, he was sent as part of the British team to join the Manhattan Project, where he witnessed the Trinity nuclear test on July 16, 1945. After the war, he spent more time developing aircraft which had recently broken the sound barrier until he retired in 1952. However, he would continue to publish research over the next 20 years, publishing papers until he had a stroke at the age of about 86, dying a few years later, but not before getting into some trouble for his energy calculations at the Trinity test. In 1950, Life magazine had published some pictures of the test that had timestamps from the start of the blast and a physical scale of the blast radius. So using the time t, the radius r, the air density rho, and energy E, he used the Buckingham Pi theorem to conclude that there was one non-dimensional parameter that characterized the efficiency of the blast. The images confirmed that the radius and time had a two-fifths power law between each other. Assuming that the density was constant, and with some guesswork of the efficiency of the bomb, he was able to estimate that it released between 16 and 24 kilotons of TNT, with the accepted but classified 20 kiloton value right in the middle. This triggered a brief investigation to see if he had obtained any of the information illegally, though the exact details are hard to find. All of this because of a fucking Pi theorem. If you like this video, then like this video. If you want to put me in the spotlight enough to get me put on a watch list, please subscribe and share with your friends. Thank you for watching.